Thanks for joining us for this session, What Do Buyers Want? It's the actual, the heartblood of, uh, of MIP formats, you know, talking to people responsible for commissioning, licensing uh, formats to find out what's in their minds when they're making those decisions. We've got a great panel here today, Jennifer, Calais, and Alan, and I'm going to ask them before we get into conversation to uh, briefly give you a description of who they are and what they do. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly open and interactive uh, session, so if you do have a question at any time, put your hand up and, and you can ask it directly to, 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 to the panel. So uh, I'm going to start by asking them each uh, who they are and what they do. Uh, Jennifer Detman, I'm the Executive Director of Studio Un and Unscripted at CBC Television in uh, Canada. I oversee um, sports and factual entertainment, variety, lifestyle, talk, reality. I think that's all the genres. Thank you. Kelly? Uh, I'm the channel director of SPS Discovery in Sweden. Uh, that's the second largest uh, commercial station in Sweden. Uh, some 100 million euros every year spent on, on content, uh, and I'm the, the one deciding what content to buy. Hi there. I'm Alan Tyler. I'm executive editor, entertainment commissioning at the BBC, which means that I'm responsible for commissioning entertainment content across all four BBC television channels. So between them, that's a really good uh, so, um, cross-section of channels and different programming requirements. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, for each of the panellists what their particular focus is and what's working well for them. Um, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to start uh, with you by asking you, you know, what has been the programming success in the formats area for you over the past 12 months and how does that inform your sort of development agenda going forward? Well, I, I would say uh, Dragon's Den continues to be our, our hit show. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's going into its uh, ninth season next year. Um, and it just continues to, to resonate with uh, Canadians. For us, it's fantastic. It's uh, low cost. It's sponsor friendly. Uh, you can switch out Dragon's and, and audiences still keep coming to it. So uh, that one for sure is a success. Um, I think as we go forward for us, public broadcaster, we're in belt tightening mode, so we really are looking for low cost shows, but ones that really uh, are high quality, that are smart and entertaining, but really have uh, a participatory uh, experience to it. And apart from Dragon's Den, which other formats are on the channel at the moment? How are they performing? What's your view of other stuff that you have right now? Well, um, we had uh, a few things. This year we had, um, it was our first foray in prime time in branded entertainment and uh, a cooking show. It was called Recipe to Riches, an original format uh, out of uh, Canada. And uh, it was a bit of a flyer. We thought we'd see how it did, and it, was, it performed quite well for us, actually. Um, so it was... What does performing quite well for you mean in numbers terms these days? What are you happy with? Um, probably in Canada, you know, 700,000 for us okay. is, is good. Um, but uh, again, we weren't sure if cooking would perform well, but I think because it was a home cook and it was a really aspirational, feel-good television show, show that uh, it really resonated with audiences. Great, okay, well that's good, gives us a good perspective of what's happening right now. Uh, Carly, same question, uh, what, what's been working for you on the, on the channel? Especially uh, workplace reality, we're strong there at 8 o'clock every night, more or less, and uh, also a new step for us in, in, in broadening up in, in genres is uh, reality competition. And Top Chef, our lo local adaption on Top Chef, Just Desserts, really went through the roof, really ha happy for that. Uh, and, and in terms of numbers, that's sort of the same. Six, seven hundred thousand, that's very good to us. Under five hundred thousand, not so good. Where does that rank in terms of your top shows? How does it compare? Does it get into the top ten? It will. It will. Okay. Yeah, nowadays. I mean, it used to be a million, even at our channel as number two, but uh, given, you know, the OTT, the, the structure of the OTT world, it's not there any longer. So I would say it's top ten show, yeah. And what other formats uh, have you tr tried or are working on the channel? I mean, once again, we have added on the reality competition side, uh, and that really works. Once again, uh, workplace reality. And we have strong profiles that could pretty much do whatever lifestyle-related thing uh, they want. And then we have a bring in the, the, the clowns. It's a new co-developed format internally from us with the production industry or, or production company uh, that sort of 
uh, has a new, new, new flavor of it. So, so we're pretty happy. All of our local produced shows are above station average in prime time. We're doing pretty good now. Good. Alan, I know you've got many different channels to satisfy there, but could you give us uh, an overview of what have been the, the biggest successes that in, in the, what we would define format genre over the past year? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think the, the important thing about the BBC is to understand that BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three and BBC Four are very different channels, that each of them does something very bespoke and that as a whole, that makes for a kind of holistic offering for us. So when you think about BBC One, we're talking really about big, mainstream, broad entertainment formats that unite the family. And a perfect example of that would be The Voice. And that's, you know, that's been a really strong performer for us. And as people will know, has been recommissioned to a further two series. Um, you know, and that will do anything between sort of seven and 10 million a week on BBC One. BBC Two is slightly different. That's much more about what channel controllers would refer to as intelligent pleasure, um, which I think neatly describes the shows that would work there. So Dragon's Den is precisely the kind of show that will work for us on BBC Two. And in fact, its last series, where it was coupled with Top Gear, it did fantastic business. It did three million, while Top Gear will do six, seven million. Um, BBC Three, that's a youth skewing channel. So, you know, probably of all the channels, that's the only one that's defined by age. So we look for 16 to 34 year olds and things like junior doctors, which perhaps doesn't feel like an entertainment show, but is really entertainment, um, although it has serious purpose, that will do, you know, 700,000 to a million for us. And on BBC Four, which I think's the surprise for people, a lot of people don't think about that channel as providing or taking formats. We have a quiz show there called Only Connect, which will do about a million on every outing. Now, that is an incredible rating for BBC Four. That's a hugely successful show and and the truth is that all of those shows work and I'm sorry given giving you all of this on a Sunday morning but the reason all of those shows work I think is that they really understand the audience they're speaking to great okay so that gives you a snapshot of, of what these guys like uh, and, and the sort of successes those programs have um, let's talk about development um, what what do you have in development at the moment and uh, how does that reflect the sort of stuff that you're looking for from the international market well, maybe I'll talk about a couple shows we've got coming up on our schedule next year. We have uh, one that's um, an original format called uh, Canada's Smartest Person. And um, it's I would describe it as a, a, a value-add entertainment show with there's extra takeaway. It tests the theory of um, intelligence. It really challenges that um, using the uh, theory of multiple intelligence. Very participatory, uh, co-viewing, so it'll reach a broad, uh, a broad audience. So that's that one. The other one is a Banerjee format called uh, Of All Places. We've changed the name to, or, or sorry, it's called Comedy on the Edge. We've changed it to Of All Places. Um, and it's a comedian, a comedian traveling to small town uh, Canada, where those uh, small towns really are down on their luck. Uh, he meets the characters, he um, will learn about their traditions and customs, and then he turns that into a stand-up routine that he performs to the, the town. So it's very charming and quaint, and it's a way for get us to get at that small town Canadian experience. And where will those two shows uh, sit in the schedule, and when will they come on air? They'll come on the air, one is for fall, and the other is uh, winter 15, um, 8 p.m. They're both uh, wide range. And, and what job were they designed to, to do when you sat down with, uh, with, with, with your planning meetings, at the, however long ago that was? What, what were you looking for, and, and what job was, were those shows designed to do for the, for the channel? Well, the uh, first one was really, I mean, part of our job as a public broadcaster is to really... Uh, unite the country to bring them together in some sort of shared experience. So that's definitely Canada's smartest person. Um, what so we love about that is that there it comes with an app. There is a pretest, so it really is as as the show is happening on the air across the time zones. It's very complicated. People can play against um, the contestants as they go. So uh, that served that uh, purpose and very sponsor friendly. And the other, really, we haven't done a lot in unscripted comedy, so we wanted to, to try that. I mean, in Canada, I think we can do a lot more. We serve up to the world a lot of comedians. 
I think because of our bleak, bleak winters, I think we need a good laugh now and again. So um, uh, that's more of a, a tester to see how it does. Great. Um, Callie, what's uh, on the slate for you this year? What have you got high hopes for? Uh, two things coming up is uh, physical uh, competition. Uh, we are driving in that direction. We used to be there with the wipeout of the world and so on, and we are taking a, a big step into that again to, to unite the family. We think the United Viewing will, will, will grow and be important to us. Another thing that's coming up is scripted uh, in the crime series, you know, Sweden and, and because of the same reasons that you are saying. We live in the dark, five or six months a year. So we tend to make up stories and, and be creative on that side. So we are taking our first step into crime, the crime genre of, of scripted, um, and we look forward to that. It's together with, with uh, other, uh, I would say, more, more um, uh, they've been in, in this kind of industry longer than we have, so, so we are not, you know, the first window for these uh, crime shows. But still, I think that's an important step uh, for us. So, so that's the two outstanding things. Can you coming. tell us a little bit more about that crime series? What's it called? Who's it with? When's it on? Actually, uh, your magazine wrote about it. It's called 100 Code, and, and it's Mikael Nyqvist, the, the leading role. Uh, we know him from, from you know all the Stieg Larsson uh, books and, and the movies from that. So uh, it's, it's pretty much um, a, a typical, I, I would say not invent anything new, it's a typical Swedish crime drama, dark and, and quite violent. And, 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 and very, very good, I would say. And, and this, uh, is it, are you investing more money than you normally would in this scripted format, or are you playing about the same on the game? I would say reallocate. I mean, it's more money when it comes to the genre, but it's not, not more money than, than, than the 100 mil euros I, I talked about. So re reallocated uh, money to, to scripted. Interesting. Yeah. Cool, very good. Alan, what's, uh, what are we going to look forward to on BBC in the next... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You mean what am I going to regret seeing? Right? <laughs> <laughs> the um, so yeah, I think there are probably a few shows coming up which we're really excited about. I mean, some which I'm happy to announce here for the first time actually, which we we haven't yet put into the public domain. So for BBC One, we're doing, and this has been in development this project for probably two years. Um, we're doing a new show called You Against the Nation which we are taking to pilot, um, and which is a, a truly interactive uh, quiz show where contestants at home will play contestants in the studio. And we think that's a first and has taken a long, long time, actually, to find a mechanic which allows us to genuinely say to the home audience, if you play along with this, you will impact what is happening in the studio. So it's risky, and I think, actually, that's what makes it really exciting. It's uncharted territory, and it feels, as a result, like something we should be trying. So we're really enthused about that. So it's called You Against the Audience. You uh, Against the Nation. You Against the Nation. Yeah, that's uh, a working could, title. Could you change. give us an idea about the mechanic and how that show would work? Yeah, so what you have in studio is you have six contestants, each of whom, if they want to win tonight, not only have to beat each other, but they have to beat the nation. And I don't want to say too much about how that mechanic operates. I think it would be nicer if that surprise happens on screen. But it is completely interactive. If you are sitting at home and you decide that you want to play along, you can do that. So and we're which, going to pilot that and see how it works. Which, which channel is it designed for in which slot? So that's designed for BBC One, and it would be in the heart of Saturday nights. But right. it, it will depend how the pilot goes. But that feels like quite a big step. If you, the companies involved, that's STV and Wild Rover, have been developing it for a long, long time. And the channel controller, Charlotte Moore, and um, the controller of entertainment commissioning, Mark Lindsay, have really swung behind it and have really backed it. And I think, you know, hopefully it's quite heartening in terms of content generation that we've taken that length of time to build a show that we really, really believe in and that we want to get right for the audience. So there's, there's sort of big things like that. And then there's, there's other shows which have surprised us this year. So part of what we've done in BBC Three is we've, we've piloted a couple of projects, but we've actually decided to air the pilots. And that's, that's been a bit of a revelation in that the reaction to the pilots was really good. And as a result, 
Um, we then decided straight away to commission series off the back of them. But again, that's quite risky and can, probably not. Can you talk really specifically about what those shows were and, and what you think they did right to get those commissions? What yeah, I, I will be short for this, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. The, it won't um, go any further. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So th there are two shows which we did that with. One was a dating show, which I think might be here, actually. It's called Sexy Beasts. Um, and if you haven't seen it yet, I, I would genuinely commend it to you. It's a really surprisingly different dating show. Now, if you said to us, we would like to do dating on BBC Three, we would probably have said, no, we're not interested. But the truth is that format was so different, so imaginative and so unexpected and played so well with our audience when we aired the pilot that we decided, right, let's, let's take the plunge and take that to full series, which we've done and which I don't think has been announced yet actually but we are going to full series on that and the other one is is a show called killer magic which i think is also here um which again if you said to us magic we we would sort of think does that feel like it's an oversubscribed territory how is that going to work how is it going to feel fresh the thing about killer magic is they found a way to make street magic feel competitive i think that's the dynamic at the heart of it that changed it and made us look at magic in a slightly different way. So both of those and You Against the Nation are good examples of what's coming up. Does anyone have any questions? I know that's very bold of me to ask at this time in the morning, but if there is anyone with a question, you can put your hand up. Is it, are there are questions already. Uh, could you have a microphone down here, please, and the lights up a little bit? Is there someone with a mic? No, take, could you just um, shout your question? <laughs> So the question was in uh, the launch of the new CBC series called Canada's mm -hmm. Smart Person, Smart person. <laughs> uh, the app strategy, is that built in from the start as part of the uh, uh, program or is it something that comes along sort of afterwards developed by somebody else? Um, well, we've done this show, I should uh, clarify, we did it as a one-off special and it was uh, hugely successful for us. And we knew going into it, when the producer pitched to it to us, we knew that there would be this uh, app, it would be definitely part of it. In Canada, we're very lucky to have um, different funding bottles, bodies, which uh, um, allow us to do more uh, experimentation in digital, so this thing is separate from it because we're accessing the, the digital money, but really ultimately it's part, you know, part and parcel of, of the whole experience. Is it the same budget? Does it all come out of the same budget or do you have separate budgets still? Separate budgets. You do? Yeah, we do. We do with this because again, we're accessing different funding. Okay. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? So um, I've got a question for you. Um, let's go the other way around, Alan. Um, what do you need that you haven't got at the moment? What, what, if, you were, if you were looking to fill one particular hole on one particular channel or to get ready for the decline of one particular franchise, where are you looking right now? What, 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 what should people be thinking about if they're coming to you with something you don't have? I think the, the thing about that is it, independents often ask us that question, as do in-house. And I think the tricky thing is for us to be over-prescriptive. I don't know what the rest of the panel feel, but I, I almost feel the danger is that we say we don't want or we do want. And actually, it's much, much better if we just remain completely open to the unexpected. I think that the shows that I referenced are good examples of where we wouldn't have predicted that those are territories we would have liked to, to be in. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I was um, thinking about that too as you were talking about um, the dating show. And I've often said as a public broadcaster, we wouldn't do dating. But exactly, as we went through this cooking experience, we realized, well, maybe we would. So we really are saying, if it is smart and if it is entertaining and if it is a, a certain level of quality and if it can sort of, it, it's got in its DNA the ability to bring the get, together the country in some sort of experience, then we're open to any kind of genre. I think you're absolutely right. 
Callie, what about you? Are you, are you looking at, uh, at particular areas at the schedule, of the schedule at the moment? Yeah, we do, but it's quite dramatic in Scandinavia, especially Sweden right now. I mean, we're down in putt level in 20% uh, year to date, more or less. So we need to, first of all, get people to watch telly, you know, and that's telly telly, not, not uh, the digital side of it, even though we need to, you know, work uh, very, very active there also. Uh, another thing is the 8, eight o'clock slot. We, we need to really get them in there and get them started. So we need to push more investments, more creativity. And I agree with you guys. I mean, you used to, to be pinpointing things that you didn't like or like. Nowadays, you need to pretty much listen to every everything. I know it's a bad answer, but still, you need to be really open-minded. You need to be really into details on every angle of, of ideas, I would say. I, I really agree with that. I think part of what I think is interesting is that the more collaborative the development process, the better it is. And I think, the, I certainly remember when I was in production, the thing that was most dispiriting was to meet a commissioner or a controller who within five seconds of your pitch starting had kind of decided, I'm not sure that we want to do that. We've been there before. I think it's absolutely up to us to be open. How did they notice they were doing that? Did they sort of go... <laughs> <laughs> the Blackberry. Yes, yes, yes. They tune out slightly. But the, um, but, and, and actually, I think that's... Maybe it's a cultural thing. Maybe people realise more now that, that in television, I think you have to be... And actually, across platforms, I think you have to be open to perhaps familiar forms, but new ways of doing them. And, and that's maybe the, the key to a really successful discussion, I think. Let's talk about that, that phrase, across platforms, because it's, it's been creeping in for years, but it's perhaps now sort of standing up in the room a little bit more. And there was a conversation we had yesterday about how changing uh, content consumption patterns and distribution structures are, are reinventing the way that audiences come to television. I'm talking in particular about the rollout of SVOD services and binging on uh, content on iPads and uh, using iPlayer and time-shifted view and all the stuff that I imagine makes your life difficult. Um, when you're developing um, projects nowadays, because I, I, I still don't think there's been a groundbreaking multi-platform project that's truly multi-platform yet, really, in the way that there was with Big Brother and how that maybe changed the genre dramatically. What's your multi-platform, digital, whatever you want to call it, development strategy, uh, Jennifer? And, and, and where do you think success is going to come from in that space? I, you know, I think it's interesting. I think that you're, as you're raising the consumption patterns, um, they're changing so significantly on the scripted side. And for us, they're having an impact because certainly the type of content that I create, it doesn't do so well with the binge viewing. It just, that's not how people traditionally consume it. Does that worry you? Does... A, a, a little bit. I mean, I think that we're, well, but there's opportunity. And I think the opportunity is the type of content that we create on the unscripted side is far more participatory participatory, that whether or not you can do play along or whether or not it sparks a debate or conversation. So I think uh, that we always have to be thinking, I'd say to every independent producer, gone are the days when you just think about the time slot that you're pitching for. You have to come to us with a full 360 experience. That's the type of idea. If you want us to commission it, that's, how, you know, that's what it needs to be. Cool. Callie, what's your approach to multi-platform development and is it is it is it part of your th your th thought process yeah it's more or less top of mind now we tend to have it's the third uh, most important thing but number one when it comes to top of mind and that's dangerous also by the way because you you can get carried away by you know good sentences in, in pitches and, and and when you develop so you need to be be careful but but I agree with you on the big bro big brother side and the utopia is one case you know but it, it, it demands so heavily investments I mean, you need to, to, to put a lot of, lot of you know, luck into that basket if you're going to go for that. But I would say it's very, very important. And 10% of our viewing comes from you know, the catch-up services from, from the digital side. Uh, so that's more or less something we can live with or, or are very happy with. What we need to do is balance once again what should be you know, number one and what should be number two when, when we focus and when we move forward. So you said that that's number three on your list. What's number one and what's number two? I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's traditional, you know, broadcasting uh, priorities. But but it, 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 digital side used to be down there, you know. We didn't even, you know, manage the rights. Now it's up there. But I, I, I see, 
I actually did a slide for internal you know, message that it tend to be number one nowadays. It's not number one when it comes to money and, and, and all that, mm -hmm. but, but very important though. Jennifer, you were saying to me earlier that um, sometimes you have a, it's challenging trying to uh, have a conversation with someone pitching you a show who wants to retain the digital rights on a project because you need everything. It's an immersive yeah. piece. Could you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, uh, we, we, we've had some conversation with format holders where they want to withhold the digital rights in our territory. And that will never work for us because um, it has to be the brand. We have to control the brand in our territory from start to finish, and they're all interconnected. Um, and I think that's partly, and, and for us to get our money's worth, because there is such a tremendous uh, in investment in that digital space, that um, we have to be able to offer to sponsors that full experience. It can't be, you know, uh, it's like lopping off uh, an arm or a leg, really. Okay, Alan, just coming back to this digital piece and the, you know, the fact that there hasn't necessarily been a real hit in that cross-platform space, do you agree with that or, or, or do you think the BBC has done any work to, 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 to move it in the right direction? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that we have to be very careful in this space. I think the temptation is to say, right, people can access things on lots and lots of different platforms. Let's just do everything on lots and lots of different platforms. But I, I think audiences are really, really smart. And actually, what they look for in all digital content is veracity. They look for it to have integrity. Is it absolutely integral to the offer? And if it is then I think it's going to be very well received. So, for example, and you know, I don't want to harp on about it, but I think the thing about You Against the Nation is that it absolutely requires cross-platform engagement. It's absolutely integral. So I would say we've done you know, quite a bit of work there. I think there are other areas where you have to think, right, well, a, a pleasant addition to the viewing experience is perhaps what the viewer wants at the moment, or perhaps they want to interact passively with the show. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think what we should do is assess each idea, and this is the approach we tend to take. We work very closely with um, uh, interactive executives on all of our shows. So we, we tend to look at a show and say, does it demand and does it require a presence on a different platform, how do we make that absolutely integral to the show? I think for production companies and for producers in general, that's the thought you should have at the start of the process. So there was a time at the BBC when, I, I can't remember who said it, maybe it was Ashley Highfield or, or, or somebody back in the day that the BBC would never consider a project which didn't have an interactive element going forward. Is, are those days past? Well, I think it's, it, I mean, I guess it's a question of what becomes the norm and what best serves the project. I think it would be really... It, it, at this moment, it wouldn't be wise for us to make a generalised rule. I think we have to assess everything and, and think of the audience. That tends to be... I mean, I know it sounds a little um, saintly, and I don't mean it to, but our, our purpose is genuinely to think about the audience and to think what is the best audience experience in terms of this show. So we would always look at it. We won't always apply it if it's not the right strategy. OK. Does anyone else have a, um, another question? I'd like to get off their chest. There's a question just there. I think we've got a microphone coming now for you. It's winging its way. If you could just let us know who you are and where you come from before you ask the question. Anil Vanvari from IndianTelevision.com in India. Are you all paying producers extra money for the extra effort they're putting behind the digital strategy? Did you hear that? Did, yep. you get, did you listen? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. I, I mean, it, it, it will always depend. We don't tend to compartmentalise our development funding in that way. Um, what we tend to do is, at the beginning of a project, we will have a really full discussion about where it's going, what it requires, how it might develop, and often we will seed development funding to the company based on that discussion. What we probably won't do is compartmentalise things in that way. We won't say this is to develop the linear TV offering, this is to develop the online offering. It will all be one development cost. Yeah, you know, but, but it's different legs. You have different beasts who operate in the digital space and it's a different set of uh, creative minds which will come into play. Yeah, what, so what I would say is if you're a company and you're pitching us an idea and that idea requires that you're using parts of your organisation, you wouldn't be using to develop simply a linear TV offering, we would expect and reflect that in our development funding. 
Kala, how, what's your answer to that question? No, I, I would say we're, we're bad, uh, bad example. We, we're separated. It's hard to, to work together to, you know, co collaborate. And, and we are looking into that, of course. You need to, you need to integrate both the money and, and the decision making and the process, you know, uh, on the digital side. But I, I think we have a lot to learn from, you know, getting integrated. So we're bad example. It's totally separated. We're integrated and similar to Alan, I would say that it depends on I mean, what we expect from the producers. They come with uh, at least a, a germ of an idea of how it might work and how it might play out. But we have a big, you know, interactive team that uh, we would assign as part of the development process for the independent producer. And also, as I said, we have funding in Canada. Um, accessible for, we've got an experimental fund, we've got all sorts of digital funds that producers can tap to help with that. Okay, any other questions? Uh, excuse me, um, uh, hello everyone, and uh, I'm from JSBC, a provincial broadcaster from China, and my question is, uh, will you use a big data strategy to plan your schedule in the future, and how do you make the connection between the audience research and the schedule management nowadays. Thank you very much. So the question is all about big data, which is increasingly playing into content. Uh, who'd like to take that one? How are you using the data attached to your content to develop your content? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we tend to, so, so this will happen in two ways. The channel, each channel themselves, will have uh, lots of data about their audience, and they will do exactly what you're suggesting. They'll, uh, they'll look at what that data is telling them about how the audience want to consume content at different points in the schedule. And that will help to inform scheduling. Um, from our point of view as a genre, so we provide entertainment into each channel, what we will do is look at data from the audience on individual shows. So how they consume different parts of the schedule where entertainment plays in. And that might inform what we think of an offer, though not entirely. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't relegate commissioners and controllers' thoughts and feelings about a project simply to data, but we would, it would partly inform what you were doing. I think what we also do, which is a really useful tool, is when we pilot, we test, we often test, not always, but we often test the pilot, um, and we look closely at that feedback, and there have been examples where that feedback has helped us in terms of designing a series. Kala, do you get involved in the data side of things? Yes, very much so, especially, as I said, uh, when the, when the pot level is done, people using television, we, we are, you know, digging into the, to, to that data every, every day, more than normally. And I would say that's a part of our success, that we find, you know, the, the opportunities and the challenges, and we put the money on the right uh, spots, uh, and, and that's why we're number two in our market with half of the budget of, of, of the number three, I would say. So we work very, very closely with that physically also. We sit like, I sit five meters from, from the people, you know, working with the research every day. So, so yeah, it's our, a part of our backbone. I would say we maybe don't use it as much. I mean, we use it in the traditional ways, but we're, we're starting to... Um, uh, we're looking for new ways and new funding to get our work done. Um, and so we're using the digital space. So we're looking now, uh, there's funding we can tap to allow us to do pilots in the digital space, which then you can get immediate audience research that's not filtered uh, to a, a pilot that perhaps is a little bit more lower cost because it's in the digital space. Um, so we're using that more now. What do you feel about the, the sort of algorithmic approach of Amazon and Netflix in terms of how they're using that, they probably are driving their development strategy by, by mining the data, the use of the audience data. Uh, clearly the, the shows they're green lighting obviously have been run through some algorithm. Does that worry you that these guys are doing that or do you think that they'll under, it'll under, fundamentally be their undoing at some stage? No, I don't think so. I think it's one approach and, uh, you know, we watch to see the shows they're commissioning and what we're doing. I think w what you have to do, you use research, but uh, I think research is uh, connected, you know, you absolutely are using it to see what shows might respond, but I think that you also have to use your gut and you have to be open to good ideas. And to your point, you have to stop and listen and imagine 
could I see this on the channel, what would that be? Because that's, I think, ultimately where the groundbreaking is going to come from. So you need the heart as, as well you, as you the You do. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I think that's absolutely pivotal. And, and really, there's something, about, there's something about channels which should be embodied in the people who represent it. They should be providing something about tone, which is often harder to research it is exactly that it's eq more than iq yeah. though that's not to discount the iq i think that's incredibly important but you shouldn't i don't think we should lose sight of that heart mm -hmm. so there's time for one final question if anyone has one and they'd like to ask okay so I'd, I'd just like to go into the last sort of five minutes by talking about um the future the next 12 months um uh, Alan, a, a, a year from now, um, what do you hope to have achieved? Um, and looking back, uh, what would you be telling us about uh, uh, in, in 12 months' time? What's your goal, what's your aim, what's your mission? Um, well, I hope that the shows that we talked about earlier are successful, which I think you can simply never bank on. Um, that's exactly where the heart comes in. Um, so I hope that they're successful. I, I think the other thing is it would be, and this, it, it feels like a pat and eternal question in entertainment, but I, I have a sense that there's a, a turn of the wheel coming, that actually people are beginning to think slightly differently and perhaps slightly away from talent vehicles and it would be interesting a year from now to see where that development has come to because I think there are some clues to what the you know the next big turn of the wheel might be. So you think that the sort of the emphasis on finding talent to front shows might decrease a little bit? No not so much that I think the talent show itself. The talent show itself. I think, I think I it's not that yeah. that will ever decrease in popularity I think what we've seen through time is you know t television is cyclical and these things are always reinvented and then super produced and that's what makes them fantastic and gives them resonance but perhaps there are other areas in that large-scale entertainment experience that are ripe for revisiting, and it would be interesting to see that in a, about a year, I think. So could you tell us about that project? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I think it's just, just from the offers that are coming into us from uh, producers, I think people are beginning to think differently. What I will say is I think a lot of the clues for success in the future perhaps lie in looking at what has worked in terms of territory incredibly well in the past, because they, those resonances don't tend to disappear. It's simply how they're executed. Great. Well, we look forward to, to seeing <laughs> that emerge. Uh, Carrie, what, what's your uh, goal for the next 12 months and uh, what would you be happy with having uh, achieved? We, we need to attract uh, the young family. That's uh, what we target uh, at. And, and, and uh, I would like to have the big one, the big next thing. We don't have to, you know dance show, the ballroom dancing, or the, the idol, or, or voice, or whatever shows. Uh, as I said, Top Chef is a, is a sort of a format we work with, but apart from that, it's more or less local developed, or, or you know, not that big kind of format. So we, we, are, we will be aggressive, and I hope that I wake up 12 months from now and see myself with something big, with something, you know, number one-ish. Um, in our schedule. Uh, number two is, of course, to be integrated on the digital side once again, and not be frustrated or, or scared or happy case by case, but have a good strategy, good flow, a good investment, you know, policy, how to manage in that world and, and, and be, be cool about it, because now we tend to, you know, uh, we tend to be stressed. <laughs> so, so that's, well, that's have you got an idea what that show might be? I mean, is there a show out there that, that has elements of the thing you think will work for you? Honestly, no. I could sit there for two or three hours. I have a couple of colleagues out there I see now, and we can, you know, take the stage and talk and talk. But my straight answer will be, no, it's not there. I can't see it, and I can't hear about it. Okay. But, uh, Maybe after these days. I don't think so, though. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, uh, the, the 12 month mission and what would make you happy? You know, I, I think that um, we, our schedule and our schedule, we've been a little safe. And I think that I would like to see us take some risks. And ultimately, at the end of 12 months, if, if even we had Canadians really talking about us, if I had a show that really got people saying, oh my god, I can't believe the CBC did that, 
um, or wow, can you believe the CBC is doing that? So I think for me, success, it's about the ratings for sure, but I think even more so, I, it, it is about that, to really engage Canadians and to get them you know, uh, really, you know, talking about what we're doing. How do you give yourself permission to take a risk? Do you write off a certain amount of money? Do you say this is our risk, or do you employ a risky strategy? What, what, what's the way of doing that? I think we are consciously going in and looking at our schedule, and certain parts of the schedule will serve that function. So we know certainly our dramas might push out a little bit more and be bolder than perhaps they have been. Um, and I think in my world, I pull a different, a lot of different levers. I've got branded entertainment. I've got the big entertainment shows. So I think what I would be looking for is maybe a show in there that I put in the storefront window that really stands out as, as something. So I would set aside money for that. Good. Well, uh, best of luck with all of those strategies and those missions this year. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the panel. Thank you. Thank you.